Good morning. It is wonderful to be here. An absolute joy uh, to be with you again. I've been so excited to be, and so good to see so many people. It's wonderful, wonderful to be worshiping and serving the Lord together. Thank you so much for the very kind invitation again uh, to be part of not only this morning, but also uh, of today. And thank you for your kind words, Paul. It is always a pleasure uh, to share with you and be with you. I sometimes wonder, did I get my doctorate as well? I do have a twin brother. Um, he's chained to the cellar, and I think he's the one that got the doctorate, and I just uh, walked across there. But yes, it's uh, the Lord has been very, very good over the years. And uh, Beth Ann, some of you will remember Beth Ann. She sends her love to you. She's leading worship this morning in our home church in Scunthorpe, but doing very well. Got married uh, last summer, so all changed for her. Uh, but it is a joy to be with you today. And it's my joy for the next few moments, uh, my privilege to open the Bible uh, for a few moments so that we can just gather around the Word of God. I believe in the power of the Word of God like never before. And I think when we look at, we probably woke up this morning to all sorts of news reports that are happening in our world. Our world is shaking. Our world is uh, in turmoil our world is ever-changing, and that's just the big stuff that we've no control over. When we bring that right down to me and you, my goodness, every single day has its ups and downs and its challenges, but the Word of God remains constant. It remains true, and it certainly remains one of the primary constants in my life, so it's wonderful to have a few moments to open up the Bible that hopefully will encourage you. So if you happen to have a Bible with you and you want to follow the reading with me, then I'm going to read from Luke chapter 2, the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. Now, I know in modern churches we put the, the readings on the screens and stuff, but I really, really, you, 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 you've got a, a Bible course that's just been announced. I really want to encourage you when you gather together, bring your Bible so that you can look at it, read it, and follow it as we go. And I am a passionate believer in that. So whether you've got it on your phone or your tablet or in a hard copy like this, then why don't you uh, turn with me to that? And I think it's such an important thing for us as a follower of Jesus. So we're going to read two passages from the one chapter. Now, uh, as I start reading uh, the first passage, don't think you've dropped into a parallel universe. We just had Easter a couple of weeks ago, and I'm about to read a passage of the Bible that we normally only read at Christmas, unfortunately, even though it's an amazing bit of the Bible. Uh, but you might sort of woke up, woke up this morning thinking, is it Christmas already? What did I miss? How did that happen? But I want to lean into an incredible idea in something that we call the Christmas story. So I'm going to read from Luke chapter 2, starting from verse 8, and we'll read a few verses, and then we will skip on down to the chapter. So here we go. Luke chapter 2, verse 8, and it says this, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared and the angel, uh, um, with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And then we're going to stay in chapter 2 of Luke, and we're going to skip to verse 41. 
verse 41. <clears throat> and it says this. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house or in the things of my father? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature, in favor with God and with men. Mary, the woman at the center of both of these stories, was a remarkable woman, incredible woman. And she stands really unique in biblical history and in human history because she's the only woman that has given birth to the Messiah. Incredible person. And actually, we as followers of Jesus should give her special place. Now, I don't think we should worship her. I don't think that's biblical, and I don't think Mary would accept that, nor does the biblical record accept that. But we should honor her because she was an amazing woman. She is the only woman who bore the Messiah, and because she bore the Messiah, me and you are here today. So when Mary says that she is, you know, in a sense, a blessed woman, and Elizabeth declares her to be blessed above all women, there is a sense in which that is absolutely true. But part of the problem with Mary is we only tend to think of her as the woman who gave birth to Jesus. Now, when I say only, right, that's pretty amazing. But the danger is we, forgive my language now, we reduce her down to the woman who gave birth to Jesus. Don't hear that the wrong way, but that's what we tend to do, especially in the Protestant tradition. Uh, we've tended to do that. And that's a tragedy because Mary wasn't just the mother of Jesus. She was a follower of Jesus. Mary's not just there at the beginning of the story. She's there at the end. In fact, if you were to read the Gospels together, then you would, you would track Mary all the way through the story. And we see her popping up over and over again. And you'll see Mary, not just at the birth, you'll see her at the crucifixion. You'll see her at the resurrection. And we, even if we go into the book of Acts, we see her in the upper room being filled with the Spirit along with the other disciples. There's an incredible picture of Mary trekking all the way through the gospel story. I love this idea that Mary's not just there at the beginning, but in terms of, in terms of the outpouring of the Spirit, she's there at the end. Now, I know that's not the end end, but it's the last time we hear of Mary in the biblical record. That, that she's not just a mother of Jesus, which is incredible, but she becomes a follower of Jesus. She isn't just the one to give birth to him, but she follows after him. And I love that idea. And I think sometimes we miss the dynamic connection between Mary the mother and Mary the follower. She becomes the follower of the one she gave birth to. Now, some people may say, well, that's, that's obvious that she would do that, but not necessarily so. That actually, here's a woman that doesn't just say yes to the Lord in terms of giving birth to him, but we now understand she keeps saying yes to the Lord all the way through her life. And we see her in the book of Acts saying yes to the Holy Spirit and inviting the Holy Spirit into her world. Does that make sense to you? That's an important idea for us to see. And actually, I don't know if you noticed, in our 
two passages that we read, there were two dynamic references to Mary, which are really easy to miss. But I think Dr. Luke especially is dropping those two phrases in because he wants us to see something. Uh, And actually, I think those two phrases say something about who Mary was and show us why she wasn't just there at the beginning, but she was there at the end. Why she wasn't just the mother of Jesus, but she also became the follower of Jesus. And in case you didn't pick them up in the reading, let me just remind you of the verse 19 of chapter 2 says, And Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Okay, so that's when the shepherds were there at the birth story. Okay, verse 19 of chapter 2. And then chapter 2, verse 51, it says this. After Mary's had the conversation with Jesus and the whole temple experience, it says this. Then he, that's Jesus, went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And then it says this. But, but Mary, or his mother, treasured all these things in her heart. Two phrases almost identical in, in phraseology, All, almost, almost identical. And what's even re- more remarkable, the two phrases are 12 years apart. So even though we have them in the same chapter, the Bible does this sometimes, it messes with our head, in that it gives us a chronology that looks sort of really tight Uh, And yet there's a big gap in the story. And between the end of the story with the shepherds and the end of chapter 2, 12 years have passed. And yet Mary's doing the same things. Come on now. And what Dr. Luke is doing really cleverly, I think, by putting those two phrases in the same passage of the Bible. Remember, when Dr. Luke wrote his account, he didn't have chapter divisions or anything or headings like I have in my Bible. It was just a beautiful, continuous flow of text. So actually, me and you would have read that whole thing in sort of one sitting. And we would have heard patterns. We would have seen ideas. And Dr. Luke drops an idea in at the birth. Mary treasured all these things. And then 12 years later, look, look, Mary's still treasuring all these things. And that's a little clue to us that when we see a repeat idea like that in the Bible, we should pay extra attention. Now, pay attention to all of the Bible, of course. But when it's dropping in little repeat phrases or little repeat words or repeat ideas, especially to do with the behavior of a person or the behavior of God, it's like the volume's being turned up. And me and you should slow down and go, hold on a minute, that's twice we've seen that phrase. Is something being said about this woman that we should pay attention to? When Jesus is born, she treasures up all these things. And when Jesus is 12, she's still treasuring all these things. And perhaps that's something that's speaking to me and you. And one of the reasons I believe that Mary is not just a mother, but a follower, and not just there at the beginning, but there at the end, is because she learned to treasure she learned to treasure. Now, Dr. Luke's doing a lot of really cool stuff with the word treasure. In our, in our Bible, our English Bible, it just says treasured. But if you were to go under the surface of the language that Dr. Luke writes that in, he's like putting a whole bunch of things into this word that really beef it up, that sometimes just gets lost in our, in our translation, which is a bit of a shame. So, so let, me just, let me just lean into this. This will feel slightly technical. Please forgive me, but there is a point to it, and it will get us to where we need to go. The, the word that he uses for treasure can, can not just mean treasure, but it means to guard, to protect, to watch over. So, so I, I think that, that in my NIV Bible, we translate that treasure because it really means the idea of, of keeping something really close. So, so when it says that Mary treasured, it means she protected it, she watched over it, She guarded it, she preserved it, she held it close. 
All right? It's, it's that sort of strength. That, so some of you will know I'm a Liverpool supporter. If you ever came to my house and had a cup of co coffee or a cup of tea with us, we have loads of cups and loads of mugs, but there's only one cup. <laughs> that's mine. All right? And if you touch that cup, if you try to drink out of that cup, a bit like the tree in the Garden of Eden, you will surely die. <laughs> All right? It's mine. It's my Liverpool cup. No member of my family drinks out of that cup. It is my cup. Certainly a Man United supporter would never be allowed to drink from that cup. It would have to be especially sterilized after such an event. But it's precious to me. It's mine. Now, it's of no value really to anybody else. And really, if somebody broke into my house and stole it, they couldn't sell it for much either. But it's precious to me. It's special to me. And I sort of treasure it. It's the cup that I look for when I open the cupboard. It's the cup that I generally drink from uh, in our home, okay? And that's the idea that, of this word to treasure. It means to watch over, to preserve, and to keep. And so a really good way of translating that is to treasure it. But he does a bit more. In, in the 219 passage, the way he uses a word, literally we could translate it to treasure together. Uh, and that doesn't really work in English. But, but what it means is this, is that, is that Mary is treasuring it in such a way that she is holding it close. The idea here is that she is watching over it. She's keeping it close, keeping it together, right? So, so whatever Mary's doing here in terms of treasuring, she is watching over what she's treasuring, and she's keeping it really, really close to her life. And when we go to 251, the word changes a little bit, and it means to treasure through. And the idea here is almost of, of going through something. And, and the implication here is that she's treasuring in a way to protect it as she's traveling. Okay? So you're getting, in 219, she's watching over, keeping and preserving, but she's keeping it close. And then in 251, she's watching over, keeping and preserving, but she's protecting it as she travels. Are you with me so far? Now, I know it feels a bit technical, this, but stay with me. This is so, so important. Dr. Luke does one more thing with that word, which is staggering. The way he positions that word, it is an action which is continuous. So he says this, in 2.19, when she's treasuring, it's not just a one-off action. She treasured in the past. But it says when she treasured, it means she didn't just treasure at that moment, but she continues to treasure. So when we meet her 12 years later, the implication is she is still treasuring the word she got 12 years before. And then when we, when we hear of her treasuring in 251, the implication is that when she travels from the end of Luke chapter 2 into the rest of her life, what's she doing? She is continuing to treasure the things that have been given to her. Are, are you with me so far? So she's watching over, protecting. She's keeping it close. And there's a sense in which as she travels, she's protecting that particular treasure, and she's doing that continuously. Now, one more little thing. Chapter 2, verse 19, and chapter 2, verse 51, it says that she treasured up all these things. Now, I like that translation because the, the implication is that she's taking in everything that's going on around her, and she's sort of treasuring that. But if we were to translate it literally, literally as it's written, it would read, she treasured up all these words. And I think that's even more powerful. So when she speaks with the shepherds, she's not just treasuring the event. Oh, that was amazing, wasn't it? But she's treasuring what the shepherds told her. When she talks with Jesus after his encounter in the temple... She's not just treasuring the experience that she's just had, but she is treasuring the words that she heard from Jesus over that experience. Are you with me so far? So let's put it all together. Mary 
is treasuring, protecting, holding close, watching over. And she's watching over, protecting, and holding close words spoken to her by God, either through the shepherds or through her son Jesus. And she's doing that continuously. And here's the amazing thing. If, if Mary was a young teenager when, when she gave birth to Jesus, which is the generally accepted position, she was probably in our culture a young teenager. In the culture of the Jewish world, she would have been a young woman, an adult woman. Um, if she was 13, 14, 15, when we meet her in the birth story, what's remarkable is in her mid-20s, she's still treasuring. This is a pattern. And Dr. Luke is showing us that Mary wasn't just a great woman because she gave birth to Jesus. And that in itself puts her apart from anybody. But Mary becomes a great follower of Jesus because she learns some principles. She learns some ideas. She learns to treasure, watch over, keep close, preserve, and protect continuously the words that God has given her. That's why she's there at the end. That's why she's not just a mother, she's a follower. That's why she's there in the upper room getting filled with the Spirit. That's why she's part of that resurrection mission community that's taking Jesus to the end of the world. Because she didn't just give birth to Jesus, she held on to the words given to her by God, and those words have now shaped her journey protected her. As she has protected the words, the words have protected her. As she has watched over the words, the words have watched over her. As she has held the words close, the word has held her close in her moments of difficulty and trial and darkness and confusion. And that's why Mary's not just there at the beginning, but she's there at the end. And it's not just why she's the mother. She's also the father of Jesus. And I think she speaks to me and you in the 21st century. If we want to be there at the end. We got to learn to treasure some stuff. Come on. God has given words to this church. And if we're not careful, we just hear those words, receive those words and put them somewhere. But actually, no, we're called to treasure those words. Watch over those words. Rehearse those words. Remember those words. Encourage each other with those words. Protect those words so that they're not snatched away and so that we ultimately, ultimately believe that God will fulfill the words that he has spoken. Amen. Amen? But God has also spoken to individuals in this church, maybe through his Bible like this, maybe directly to you, maybe in prayer, maybe through a promise, maybe through a man or a woman of God. God has spoken to you, and you know, you know, you know, you know, you know he's spoken. And when he speaks, listen, our job is not to work it out. Because if, if you look at the story of Mary, it's clear on both accounts, she didn't understand everything she was told, right? When the shepherds come, it says, she treasured up all these things and pondered them. 2.19, she's pondering. What's all that about? And maybe still trying to work it out. And in 2.51, explicitly it says, they did not understand what he said to them. But Mary understood something. It's, it's not my job to fully understand. It's my job to grab what God has said, hold what God has said, treasure what God has said, and then eventually God will work it out for his end and for his purpose. And then we'll understand. And there are people that let go of the word because we don't understand it. And just because we don't understand what it's all going to look like, we stop treasuring it. And that's a mistake. Or we stop treasuring it because it hasn't quite happened in the time we thought it would happen, in the way we thought it would happen, uh, in, in, in the, uh, and giving us the things we hoped it would give us. And because of that, we stop treasuring. And both of those ideas are a mistake. We should treasure those words because they're words from God. 
Whether I understand how it's all going to work out or not, I treasure those words. I hold on to those words. I preserve those words. I keep those words. And I do it continuously because here's what I know. Here's what I understand. If God has spoken, if Jesus has spoken, if Jesus has dropped those words into this church or into our hearts, those words will eventually come to pass. Those words will eventually work. And it's not my job to make them work. It's my job to treasure them. It's his job to work them out. Come on, are you with me? And so Mary gives us this incredible, incredible principle of treasuring the word of God. And and I think she treasures these words because she understands they're precious. Even though she doesn't fully understand them. She understands these words are precious. Now, if you go back the way in the story of Mary, further back to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, you will see Mary engaging with the angel Gabriel and accepting the invitation to be the mother of the Messiah. Amazing. And Mary says, I'm, I'm, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you've said. Incredible words. And then she meets her relative Elizabeth, and Mary comes out with a confession or a song. We call it sometimes the Magnificat. Now remember, this is a young teenage girl speaking these words. If you were to take the time, and many, many Christians don't even know really the Magnificat exists, let alone give a bit of study to it. But if you were to give a bit of time and reflection and look at Mary's words, these amazing words of song or confession that she brings... Mary, in those words, references the Old Testament part of the Bible, or in her world, the Bible, 15 times. In her spontaneous prayer, in her spontaneous confession, she references the Bible 15 times, directly or indirectly. In her world, the Bible had three parts. It had the Moses part, it had the prophets part, and it had the writings part. She references the Moses part twice. She references the prophets part six times, and she references the writings seven times, spontaneously. Now, now listen, when someone speaks spontaneously out of their mouth, it means what they're speaking out of their mouth is already in their heart. It's already there. It's not like the Holy Spirit came down and sort of bypassed Mary's mind. No, no. Mary is speaking out in her song what's already in her heart. Uh, And John, what's the point? The point is, this is a young woman who has already been treasuring the words of God. She's already engaged with the text in some incredible way. Even though as a girl, she wouldn't be allowed to go to... Torah school and and learn like the boys learn. But somehow this young woman has such a love for the words of God that when she speaks out a song of praise spontaneously unto God, she makes reference to her Bible 15 times. And so what we learn about Mary, even before we get to the treasuring bit, is that She values the word of God as precious. It's precious to her. However she's got to understand it, it's precious to her. Uh, And so there's now a track record. This young woman is treasuring the words of God. Does that make sense to you? And what you believe is precious, you will treasure. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please don't be offended by what I'm about to say to you, but when I asked you to open your Bibles, virtually nobody moved. Now, don't be offended by what I'm about to say to you, but the challenge is, the challenge is that actually, of all the places we should be opening our Bibles together, should be here, right? Come on. Uh, And I just get nervous. If we're not opening our Bibles here, are we opening them at home? All right? Now, don't, don't be offended. You, you, can, you can talk to me afterwards about it. Uh, I, I won't be upset, but, but I don't want you to hear the wrong thing. You see, to, to me, this is the most precious book in my possession. There's no other thing I own, physical thing I own, that is more precious than that. This is the very Word of God. It's not just a book. 
It's not a novel. It's not written by some random person. The Bible says of itself that it contains the breath of God, that the Bible, the scriptures are God breathed. Wow. Wow. Now, when you believe that's precious, you'll treasure it. Not just the book in general, but the ideas, the words that God is speaking out of them. God has spoken to us as a church. God will speak to you as an individual. If God has said some stuff to us, then actually, if we believe those words to be precious, we will treasure them. If we believe this book to be precious, we will treasure it. If we believe that God still speaks today in the 21st century, then we will treasure those ideas. Amen? Not too many applause has to be said. Not expecting that. I could feel the temperature in the room drop, but you need to hear that. When I was a wee boy, I used to love Action Man. Action Man was one of my, my favorite toys. Loved it. Oh, there's me Action Man there on the screen. Before the days of computer games, I loved me Action Man. Loved, loved it. And my mom and dad, from about me being about six or seven, right through to my early teens, every birthday, every Christmas, they bought me some Action Man stuff. And I loved it. Uh, and in fact, I, I had the old model. So the old model didn't do anything clever, but they brought out a new one that had a, 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 a string that you could pull and it would speak. And then it, they brought out one with eagle eyes. It had a button at the back of the head and you moved the button and his eyes moved like that. That's about as much as it did. But I love me action man and I built the stuff up over the years. I had a tank, I had a jeep, helicopter, death slide. <laughs> loads of equipment, loads of uniforms, loved it. And, and anyone who knows me knows I'm a bit, I'm a bit sort of, so I love my stuff. If, I, if someone buys me something or I have something, I look after my stuff. My phone lasts for forever. My, you know, stuff that I, I take care of it. I, I'm, I really watch over my stuff. So, so even after many years of usage, my Action Man stuff was in pristine condition. Pristine condition. Love me Action Man stuff. And I'm about to go to Bible college and my mom said to me, son, maybe it's time to get rid of your Action Man stuff. <laughs> and I said to my mother, why? She said, well... <laughs> If I have to explain that, you shouldn't be going to Bible college, right? So, so come on, son. Yeah, let, let's go. So I, I listened to my mother's advice, and there was a wee family round, lived around the back of us in Belfast, and I hadn't got very much money. And I thought of the wee boy, and I thought, he would love that stuff. So I packed up all my action man stuff in three or four boxes. I, I went round to the family, knocked on the door, and I said, look, I'm, I'm about to leave to go to Bible college. Um, I've got all this stuff. Would would so-and-so like my stuff? Well, of course, they were delighted. And the wee boy, it was like Christmas had come early. It was marvelous. And, and I felt good about myself. And I brought all the stuff around and gave it to him. I remember going back to my mommy and saying, that was a great idea I had of giving all my stuff away <laughs> to that wee lad. She said, well done, son. A couple of days later, I'm walking around the street where the wee boy lives. And it was one of those moments where I wish I hadn't have gone that route you know what's coming next, don't you? <laughs> All my action man stuff, just lying everywhere. There were bits of uniform on the street, literally in front of his house. He had a little garden, and my helicopter was broken already. Action man, a part of his body had been dismembered. It was a terrible experience. Some of you remember going to watch Toy Story, the Toy Story movie where the boy gives his, his toys away. In the cinema, I literally cried at that moment. I remembered this action man experience. All right? And I remember seeing all my action man stuff, stuff that had taken nearly a decade to build up, all just, just trashed, really. Like, that's the truth. It was just trashed. And I remember going home to my mom and saying, Mom, do you know that stuff I give that way? It's all, it's all trashed all over the place. I remember my mom with great sympathy saying, Oh, son, get over it. Uh, you'll be fine. <laughs> but I learned, I learned something that day. I learned something that day that, that actually what I believe to be precious, <coughs> that little boy did not. It was just stuff to him. It was just something to be played with and something to be discarded. To me, it was action, man. 
It was precious. And because it was precious, I treasured it. Because it was precious, I watched over it. Because it was precious, I preserved it. Because it was precious, it remained an important part of my world. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to be there at the end, not just at the beginning, we need to be men and women who believe that these words in front of us, in the book that you have, or the words that God has given you and spoken to you about, these words are precious. And if we believe the Word of God to be precious, if you believe the words that God has spoken to you are precious, then we will watch over them, we will keep them, we will protect them, we will preserve them, we will hold them close. And not just once, not just on, on, on a day when we felt good about it, but we will watch over these words continuously, watch over these words so that we actually Hold them close in the dark days. Hold them close under pressure. Hold them close when it doesn't look like the words of God are being fulfilled, but we hold them close because we believe these words are precious. And I want to say to you, the enemy will do everything in his power to steal your words. I remember when I was going to Bible college and I was doing my A-levels at school, uh, the boys model in Belfast, and, uh, and, I, and so I'd, I'd heard the call of God, and I'd made a, quite a radical decision, supported by my parents, supported by my pastor, supported by my church. I was going to leave school, go and get a job, and then go straight off to Bible college the following year. So that was the plan, uh, and so th that was the decision I made, and it felt good to me, it felt good to the, to, to the family, and so we went and did that. I thought, well, I'll go into school, and I'll, I'll tell uh, I've got to tell my headmaster, but I want to go and see especially uh, my RE teacher, my religious education teacher, because he's a cracking guy. And so I thought, I'll go in and see him because he loves Jesus. He's a follower of Jesus. He's a brilliant, he loves teaching the Bible in the class. Uh, and he, he'll be the first person I go and see. And I remember going in to see him. And I said, sir, uh, I've come to tell you I'm leaving school and here's why. And I explained the story. I'd got the call of God on my life. I wanted to go off to Bible college. I was leaving school. This was the plan. His first words to me, without exaggeration, his first words to me were this. God has not spoken to you. Right? He didn't like start the conversation gently. He just said to me, now remember, I'm 15 going on 16 at this stage. So I get it. I get it why he would be looking at the skinny, spotty kid from Belfast who's just told him God has spoken to him, and I could understand why he's pushing back on that. But he pushed back with such brutality, it completely shocked me. Now, this man was a follower of Jesus. This man loved Jesus, and he was a good man. So it's no criticism of him. It was just a shocking moment. And he said to me, God has not spoken to you. He said, here's what you need to do. Finish your education, go to university, get a job, then think about going to Bible college. Uh, he said, if you leave school now, you're a fool. That's what he said. And, and I remember really not really knowing what to say to this incredible man. And I just said to him, sir, I think you're wrong. God has spoken to me. I've heard God speak and I need to go to Bible college. Now, if I'd have listened to him, I would not be here. Like, and some of you, after this sermon, maybe would have been pleased about that. I don't know. But, um, but I, I would not be here. Okay? Uh, and, I, and then I had to go and see my headmaster. Now, I'm now in fear and trepidation because my RE teacher is a follower of Jesus. And he's just kicked my pan in. Like, he's literally, like, aggressively pushed back against the Word of God. I'm now going to see my headmaster. And my headmaster is is uh, not a follower of Jesus. I'll just put it that way, okay? He was definitely not a Jesus follower, a brilliant educator, but not a follower of Jesus. So I'm now shaking in my, in my boots. I, what, he, he's going to absolutely tear strips off me here. So I knock on his door and I walk in and Mr. Davis, I can use his name because he's no longer around, Mr. Davis stood up from behind his desk and I said, Mr. Davis, I've come to tell you that I'm leaving school. And Mr. Davis said to me, I'll never forget it till the day I die, I know why you're leaving. Now, nobody knew this was a secret. The only person in the boys' model who knew was my RE teacher, and I told him like two minutes ago. So 
I said, I said to Mr. Davis, what, what do you mean you knew? He said, he said, I knew why you're leaving school. And I said, okay, go on then, tell me. He said, the, the day you walked into this school as a first-year student into the courtyard, he said, I saw the hand of God on you. And then a whole series of dots connected because Mr. Davis had sort of, let me put this kindly and carefully, it sort of stalked me through my <laughs> education career in the boys' model because I wasn't the brightest boy. I wasn't the cleverest. In fact, when I started that school, I was in one of the lowest classes. So, so it wasn't because I was brilliant or I was a genius, but this man kept popping up very specifically in my educational journey in the most remarkable ways and became a continuous encouragement to me. And I didn't really understand why until that moment. So, so here was my experience. I've heard from God. God's spoken. I'm treasuring his word. The first person I tell that to is a follower of Jesus who tells me that's not treasure. Get rid of it. And then I go to a non-Christian who shouldn't know anything about the Word of God, shouldn't know anything about treasuring God's Word, and he says, actually, yes, the, the call of God is on your life because I saw that five years ago when you walked in to the courtyard of this particular school. Amazing. An amazing moment, ladies and gentlemen, where it taught me, it taught me, if I am relying on other people's response to the Word of God as to whether or not that Word is precious or not, then actually I could end up jettisoning and rejecting something that God has said to me just because somebody else doesn't agree with what the Lord has said to me or the Lord has said to this church or the Lord has said to us. People will always have their opinion about the Word of God. They will always have their opinion about the Bible. They will always have their opinions about what they believe God has or hasn't said to you. And we should listen to wisdom. We need to listen to men and women of God, but ultimately, ultimately, we will be people who treasure because we believe God has spoken to us. God has spoken to me. God has deposited something into my world. And Mary treasured it, even though, even though it may have been questioned, even though people may have disagreed with it, Mary questioned it. Uh, Mary treasured it because she believed it was the very words of God. And, and, and I love this idea that when we look at the life of Mary, Mary's treasuring paid off. I, I love what Isaiah says in the context of the word of God. Listen to these words. God's speaking of his own word. My word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And I love this idea that, that actually if we treasure long enough, and I don't, know, I don't know how long long enough is. My job is not to work the word out. My job is to treasure the word that's been spoken. God has spoken promises over my life personally that, that seem like impossible. But I knew he spoke, right? And I'm still holding on and treasuring things he has said to me as John Andrews, right? Not just as a follower of Jesus through his word, but things I believe he said to me. I'm still treasuring. I'm still holding on to those words. He has spoken to me things about my family yeah. Yeah. And, and members of my family that look at this moment absolutely impossible, totally impossible. Genuinely, I'm not saying that for a sermon, genuinely. Yeah. What I know God has spoken to me, for example, about my son and where my son is, that is impossible. So, so if, I, if I look at the fact the Word of God hasn't been worked out or isn't being worked out or I don't know how it's going to be worked out, here's what will happen. I'll stop treasuring it. 
And the enemy wants us to look at those ideas. He wants us to, he wants to remind us God spoke, but nothing's happened. God spoke, but it's still not worked out. God spoke, but you didn't get what God said you would get. And the danger is then we let go of the words of God. We let go of those promises. We let go of his, his word to us instead of continually treasuring those words. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know where you are with this stuff. I don't know where you are on your own journey. But here's what I do know. If I, if you, if we can continue to treasure the Word of God, we give Him, can I say this reverently, the chance to do what He has promised He will do. And the Word that God has spoken to you as an individual, the Word that God has spoken to this church, will not return empty. It will achieve what it was sent to achieve. It will accomplish what it was sent to accomplish. Not because I say so. Not even because you say so. But because he said so. He said so. His word is powerful. His words are true. His words are faithful. His words will accomplish what his words have been sent to accomplish. And my job is not to work it out. My job is to treasure it. My job is to hold on to it. My job is to keep it so that I'm not just there at the beginning when he spoke. But I'm there at the end when he fulfills it. It's not just a word conceived in me at the beginning but it's a word that we see fulfilled at the end. And my job, as I've learned, and I think Mary has helped me and inspired, my job is to treasure those words. Don't let them be stolen. Don't let them be corrupted. Don't let them be put to the side. Don't let them be abandoned. Don't let them be abused. Don't let them be slandered. But treasure them. And can I say this, ladies and gentlemen, every single day I remind the Lord of his words. Not because he's forgotten, but because I might. And I remind him of the words that he spoke to me, the words he spoke to my family, the words he spoke over my children, the words he spoke over the purposes that he declared for my life. I remind him of those words every day, believing that if I treasure them, his words will ultimately produce what they were sent to produce. Amen? Let me pray for you just where you're sitting. Just close your eyes, bow your heads, perhaps whatever you're comfortable with. Time has gone. I'm not going to keep you very much longer. You've been very patient to me. You've been kind. I hope that nothing I've said has offended you in an unnecessary or unhelpful way. But his words are precious. The psalmist declares that the word of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. That the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The psalmist said in the same psalm, your words are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. Your words are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. He concludes that very psalm by saying this, may the words of my mouth, may the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We have an enemy who wants, who hates you, hates you because you carry the image of Jesus, hates you because you are a child of God, hates you because you are part of the purposes of God. He hates you and he hates the word of God within you. In the very beginning, he said to our first parents, did God really say? Are you sure that's what he said? Why? Because he understands that when we let go of the treasure, we lose something of the Lord's power and life within our being. But here's what I've discovered, ladies and gentlemen. If I guard the word, the word guards me. 
If I preserve the Word, the Word preserves me. If I watch over the Word, the Word will watch over me. If I hold it close, the Word will hold me in the midst of darkness and difficulty and trial and the ups and downs of everyday life. And so I want to pray very specifically for people in this room who, like Mary, have received some words. You heard something from the Lord. However it came to you, you heard some words from the Lord. Words about your family, words about your future, words about even this church, words, treasure that was given to you. And somehow the stuff of life has battered those words. Somehow the enemy has pushed into those words. Somehow the everyday cut and thrust disappointments have imposed themselves on that treasure. But the Holy Spirit wants to say to you today that what God started, He will finish. That what He spoke, He will bring to completion. That the word that He sent will not return empty. That the things that He promised will accomplish what they were sent to accomplish. And for just a moment or two, I want to specifically pray for people in this room, and you know that's you. You know that's you. And I want to pray that you will be strengthened in treasuring His words. I want to pray that fresh faith will come into your world as you treasure His words. I want to pray that instead of disappointment, there will come joy and fulfillment as you treasure His words. That even though you still can't work it out, that we come to a place of faith believing He is able to do what He promised to do. So if that's you, if that applies to you, it could be one person in this room. But if that's you, while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, I just want you to quietly and quickly stand to your feet. You'll know who you are. It's a very specific word. I'm just going to give this another 10 seconds or so before I pray. Now then, those of you that are standing, thank you for standing. Thank you for your, for your courage. Thank you for your humility. Thank you for the faith to respond to what God has said. Now listen, the enemy wants to say to you, has God said? Did he really say that? But you know, the people standing in this room know, they know, you know, you know, you know, God spoke. And if you know he spoke, those words are true. Those words have power. And those words, for those of you standing, will fulfill what they were sent to fulfill. It will happen. Not because I say so. I'm just a man, a broken man at that. These words will happen because God said so. God said so. And as Mary treasured these words, she gave in her own life the opportunity for the words to be fulfilled. Those of you that are standing, just put your hand across your heart just as a, a physical sign of once again holding something close. Imagine that word is a on a piece of paper. It's like you're holding it to your heart. You're going to protect it. You're going to keep it. You're going to watch over it. You're going to treasure it. You're going to this from this day onwards to remind the Lord every day, this is what you said. This is what you said. 
and what you said must come to pass. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now standing in this room. Lord, I pray that the words you have spoken to them will live again. Words that life has battered will live again. Words that disappointment has challenged, these words will live again. Words that the passage of time has eroded, these words will live again. Words that doubt has undermined, these words will live again. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus for the individual standing in this room, that Lord, your word will live again in their hearts. And I pray that in them, a fresh faith will arise. I pray in them, passion will arise. I pray in them, a fresh enthusiasm will arise. I pray, Lord God, a fresh courage will arise in them as they consider the words that you have spoken into their lives. I pray like Mary, they will be men and women who treasure, who hold close, who watch over, who keep, who preserve, and who do it continuously so that they will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That Lord Jesus, as they hold on to your word, they release to you how that word will be fulfilled. Lord, it's your job to fulfill your word. It's our job to believe your word. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, as they believe, as they hope, as they cling to that word, as they treasure those words, that Lord, every person standing now will see the fulfillment of the words of the Lord. Your words, Lord, will accomplish over their lives that which it was sent to accomplish. And in the name of Jesus, I say amen. I say amen over the word of the Lord. I say amen over the promises he has made to you. I say amen over the words that he has given to your heart. I say amen. I say amen. I say amen that the word of the Lord will accomplish what it was sent to accomplish and will fulfill what it was sent to achieve. And so, Lord, we come against every weapon of the enemy that would seek to slander, distort, and abuse the word of God. No weapon formed against this word will prosper. And Lord, we pray that you will defend this word in them. That Lord, you will protect this word in them. And that Lord, you will accomplish this word in them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I say, Amen. Now, if, you, if the rest of the congregation could just stand and I'm going to pray a final prayer. God has spoken words over this church. Not just in recent history, but in history past. Words that were spoken about this church's destiny. Words that were spoken about what the Lord wanted to achieve through this community. Those words have not fallen. Those words have not died. Those words have not faded. Those words have not disappeared. The word of the Lord over this church is still true. And so, Lord, I declare your great purposes and word over this wonderful church. Lord, and it's Many different moments and many different stages and many different journeys. Lord, you have spoken words over this place, words that you are still watching over, words that you are still keeping, and words that you are still fulfilling. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that the words spoken to this community will come to pass. Words, O oh God, that they would be as a light into the darkness, that they would be as a resource to this region, that they would be, Lord God, like a city on a hill. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you will bring these words to pass, that you will provide every resource 
every person, every penny, every need, every strategy to fulfill the purposes of the Lord. And Lord, I pray that no weapon formed against your word over this house will prosper. In Jesus' name. And so, brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, may the Lord, the sustainer of the universe, may the Lord, the savior of the world, turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.